Amen. All right. Well, hey, how many guys wish that you could come to a Bible study even at night, Wednesday nights? Uh, how many guys recognize that it's Wednesday night? The rest of you, it is, so get used to it. But anyway, that's right. So you come to a church service, that wouldn't it be great to not just see a video? Because, you know, you know, we do a lot of videos for evidence and in our studies, okay? But wouldn't it be nice if you can come to a Bible study and you watch cartoons? Wouldn't it be awesome? So that's what we're, I, I, I'm here for you. You know, you know, tonight's your night. You know, your wish is my command, Jeanette. Uh, this is your time to shine. We're going to start off with a cartoon. Except this cartoon is a cartoon on evolution. Okay, as we've seen before, when it comes to proof for evolution, that's pretty much all they got is a cartoon, not based on facts. But let's take a look at this evolution cartoon. Let's take a look. for evolution's best proof uh, that uh, their belief is valid. Excuse me? Now, when you take a look at uh, their supposed premise of evolution, how it's supposed to evolve, you know, we started from some primordial ooze of fish or blob or whatever, and somehow it just decided, hey, I guess it's time to become a man, okay? But as you can see, even when you put it to a cartoon uh, to match their data, uh, it's never going to work, right? Uh, every time a fish tried to get out on land, instantaneously, within a matter of seconds, what's going to happen to that fish? It's going to die. And how many guys tonight, I think you can get this answer, how many guys would say that dead fish have no babies? All right, so you're not going to have evolution either, okay? It's impossible. As we've been seeing, folks, it's not only goofy, uh, this whole uh, evolutionary issue, uh, but it's a serious stumbling block to the gospel, okay? And, I, I, and this is why I'm excited to be able to equip us as a church with this information, because I don't think that most of us as Christians realize how much of a stumbling block evolution is. Because again, it undermines everything we believe in. We say that we came from God, that we all are descendant from Adam's. Evolution says there is no God and we're just a cosmic accident and there's no reason or purpose to lie. It's a stumbling block, okay? But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to this guy. When he was confronted with the scientific facts, the intellectual arguments for the existence of God, it radically changed uh, his life. He says this, he says, I'm writing to thank you for being the key influence in bringing me to who? to the Lord. Well, how? Because I heard you speak and I found the evidence for a creator compelling, okay? He said, I'd always thought of Christianity involved this leap of faith, which ignored all science and common sense. How many guys have heard that? Well, I don't want to become a Christian because those people are just a bunch of dumb idiots. You got to check in your brain at the door, yuck, 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 right? And of course, Jimmy, you have to talk like that when you, yeah, okay. But that's what he says, because that's a conception from society. That if you got to be a Christian, then you got to ignore intelligence, right? Not so. He said, yet it was what? True science and common sense which led me to the Lord. And once I came to the position I could believe in a creator, the rest of the Bible fell into place. What Jesus did became logical, explicable, and entirely necessary. It made me wonder how I managed to miss it for so long. Evolution blinds the minds of people, folks. He said, so I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I began to address the major areas of sin within my life and many wonderful things happen including clear answers to prayer okay so again i share these testimonies because folks it really is the proof is in the pudding evolution is a huge stumbling block for a lot of people to come to knowledge of god and a relationship with jesus christ it's a powerful way to share the gospel when you get into these issues of creation versus evolution okay and that's why we're going to continue in our study taking a look at god's witness of creation and what we're doing, again, is the premise, is we're looking at different evidences that God's given us that he's not just real. Here's the great news. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, we really can have an intimate, beautiful, personal relationship with him, the creator of the universe. And we've already seen in our 10-week study on intelligent design, that first evidence was just that, an intelligent creation, okay? When you see design in something, that implies 
a designer, and we saw it all the way from the telescope down to the microscope, looking at just scientific data. There has to be a designer, i.e. a God. And then the last uh, uh, two times, if you were here, we saw the second evidence was the evidence of a young earth or a young creation, okay? According to Jesus, we saw in the Gospels, he said the beginning point of creation was Adam and Eve. That's what Jesus said. And if you add up the dates in the Bible, you get with roughly around 6,000 years or so. That's not what evolution says. So we began to take a look at the evidence beyond just the scriptural account. And we saw the evidences that Jesus Christ is not a liar. And we saw it with the earth and the uh, logic. And we saw the evidences of, of meteor dust, helium content, topsoil, rate of erosion, the ocean salt, earth's oil and gas, the magnetic field, the spinning rate, man's history, man's writing, population statistics, the age of the Sahara, the coral reefs, the trees, and even those ice rings. We saw every single one of the, those items, looking at it with the scientific data, proves we have not been here for millions and billions of years. We've only been here, according to the scientific data, for a few thousand years, exactly what Jesus said. He's not a liar. Guess what? You're evolutionist. That's right, Bobby. Evolutionist, you got the right answer. Okay, but that's not all. The second problem that I have uh, personally with evolution, the teaching of it, as we saw the last couple of times, it not only calls Jesus Christ a liar, but listen, folks, they also call God the Father a liar. Okay, it's the worst Pinocchio syndrome you could ever think of, okay? And how many guys would say that, man, if you're going to call somebody a liar, don't call God a liar, okay? How many guys would say he probably doesn't like it? Okay, it's not a good thing, okay? Uh, but don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God. Let's see what God the Father says about where we came from. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And uh, that would be page 1, by the way. Uh, just after the preface and introduction, uh, for those of you hooked on whatever. But uh, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1. Let's listen to God the Father. Where did we come from? And again, the premise is that we opened up in prayer. If we, can't, if we can't trust the first page of the Bible, why should I trust any of the Bible? Okay, if I can't take these words we're about to read literally on where we came from, God the Father, then why should I listen to God the Father later in the New Testament when he says, I sent my son to save you, right? Maybe that's make-believe too. Maybe I need to twist that too with man's so-called wisdom. Don't think so. So let's take a look at what God the Father says, where we came from, and how long it took, by the way. Let's take a look. Verse 1. In the beginning, who? God. Notice how many times it's going to be mentioned in just eight verses. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first billionth year. Oh, I'm sorry, the first day. Not even a day, it's the first day, is what he says. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate the water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Okay, notice again, it wasn't million or billion. But according to the Bible, I think it's pretty obvious, okay, even a child, five years old, reading the Bible, you know, if you leave it alone, he's going to come to the conclusion that when it comes to creation, who did it? God is the correct answer. That's what the Bible says, right? That's the clear impression. You don't have to mess with it. Now, the problem is, what does evolution teach? Evolution doesn't say that. Evolution calls God a liar, okay? That, no, 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 you got it all wrong, okay? You can't take this literally, they would say, that we came from some mythical, magical, uh, cosmic burp that exploded into everything. In other words, what they would say is, hey, we came from the goo to the zoo to me and you, right? That's what they teach, okay? But that's not what the Bible says, okay? And again, that calls God, not just Jesus, that calls God the Father a liar, right? You can't have it both ways. And how many guys would say that's not a good thing to do again? Okay, bingo. In fact, that's the tip of the iceberg. If you take a look at the Genesis account, you're going to see that in virtually every single point, we just looked at the first two days of creation, literal two days, by the way, according to the text. And we're going to see eventually uh, also according to logic as well and the evidence. But we just saw the first couple days. But when you take a look at the whole creation account, evolution absolutely contradicts 
virtually every single point. They not only call God a liar just once or twice, I mean repeatedly they say, no, God, you got it wrong. Let's take a look at just a real quick comparison of what the Genesis says versus evolution. Okay, what God the Father says versus society, okay? Uh, Genesis says that matter was created by God. Had to come from somewhere, right? When was the last time that your checkbook, you opened it up, there was nothing there, you closed it, you opened it back up again, something popped in there. No, it doesn't, you, you don't, you don't, it has to come from somewhere, right? It just doesn't, right? Well, that's what evolution says. It says matter existed by itself. Where'd the little dirt that supposedly blew up and everything come from? Somebody had to put it there, okay? So that's calling God a liar. That's, that's the very first uh, 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 verse in Genesis 1. Uh, the Bible says that the earth was created before the sun and stars. Evolution says, no, no, God, you're a liar. Uh, uh, sun and stars uh, came before the earth. Uh, the Bible says in Genesis, the oceans were created by God before the land. Evolution says, no, 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 you got the land before the oceans, okay? Then it rained on the rocks, and that's where you get the oceans. Uh, Genesis says the light was created before the sun. Evolution says, no, 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 the sun was earth's first light. Excuse me? Uh, the Genesis uh, says land plants came first. And evolution says, oh, no, no, it was marine light that came first. You saw the cartoon, that great evidence that they got. Right? It started with this primordial ooze, and then he popped, yeah, okay, uh, calling God a liar. Uh, the Bible says that God created the fruit trees before the fish. Evolution says, oh, no, 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 it was the fish came first. You know, then the fruit trees, and all, all, well, interesting. Uh, the Bible says that land vegetation was created before the sun. Evolution says, no, 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 you got the sun before the plants. Excuse me? Uh, the Bible says that birds were uh, uh, created before the land reptiles. Evolution says, oh, no, 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 the reptiles were created before the birds. In fact, one of their latest uh, theories to explain away the disappearance of the dinosaurs, we talked about this before, hey, how about a flood? That'll do it. I mean, that's the obvious evidence, and that's the actual evidence as to what wiped out most of the dinosaurs, okay? But they don't want to admit that. And so there's actual theories we talked about before that they would say, no, 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 the reptiles came first, and don't you know that the dinosaurs evolved into birds? That's why they disappeared, because they're birds now. That's an actual theory. I love what one guy said. He says, man, you better be carrying a big umbrella when that bird's going overhead. Yikes. But excuse me, that's the exact opposite of what God says. You're calling him a liar. Uh, and, and of course, God says in Genesis, at the fall of man, chapter 3, man is the cause of death. The reason why we have death is because Adam sinned. There was no death before. It was called the Garden of Eden. It was paradise. No death. Evolution says, oh, no, no, you got to have death. Death is our friend. Death is awesome because that's what you need to produce all these misfits and mutations in order for evolution to take place. And I love bringing that up because, folks, it isn't just, well, they, they disagree. Evolution disagrees with Genesis 1.1. Uh-uh. You look at what they teach, and you look at what the Bible teaches in the Genesis account. They call God a liar over and over and over and over and over again. Now you're starting to get a feel for why people, the non-Christian, when they're confronted with evolution, and you try to get them to read the Bible or believe in the Bible, like that guy admitted, it's a stumbling block, isn't it? You have to remove that, and that's just by doing your homework, okay? But it gets even worse. That's bad enough that uh, evolution calls God a liar repeatedly. But because the church isn't equipped on this topic, many Christians have started to cave in on this, even when it comes to this dating issue. Oh, we've, okay, I guess we've been here for millions and millions of years. I mean, God says the first day, the second day, etc., etc. But they say, oh, I guess somehow we're going to have to squeeze it in there. And that's what they do, okay? Uh, there's a theory out there. It's a heresy, okay? It's called the gap theory. Have you ever heard of that? And the gap theory is what the Christians did, unfortunately, um, uh, to try to reconcile the two because they didn't have the evidence like we have today to show that you don't need to cave into the live evolution even with these millions and millions of years. And they thought, well, somehow we got to reconcile this. And so what they did is they came up with this called the gap theory, and they believe the premise is between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that stop, insert, millions and billions of years. Okay, Genesis 1-1, let me just read that for you. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, now the earth was formless and empty. I said, well, see, see, right there, right after Genesis 1, there was millions and billions. Well, first of all, did the text say that? Does the text even hint at that? No. So, but, but that's how they try to reconcile it. Now, first of all, it's unnecessary. Okay? Two, when you start to tweak with the Scripture, you know what you do to the Scripture? You mess it up. You don't mess with God's Word. It's pure. Every jot, tittle, don't mess with it, okay? And what happens is when you mess with the Scripture, whether it's the Genesis account or anywhere, you start creating contradictions in the Scripture. 
okay? And it makes it worse. Let's take a look at the gap theory and uh, let's take a look at some problems with it, folks, as to why it cannot be true. Just leave the Bible alone. God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. You don't need to try to put man's so-called wisdom in there. Leave it alone. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe God doesn't lie and man is the one that's wrong? Okay, but here's what this theory teaches. and Here's the problem with it. First of all, the gap theory is inconsistent with God creating everything. How much did he create in six days according to the Genesis account? Everything is incorporated within those six days. And it's not just in the Genesis account, it's elsewhere. Exodus 20 verse 11 says, For in how many days? Six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and what? All that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. So clearly you're talking about six literal days. And everything that was ever created happened within that time frame. That's what the Bible says, Genesis account, outside the Genesis account, right? Exactly. That's what you get if you just leave the Bible alone, okay? Therefore, the creation of the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1, and the sea, and all that is in them, the rest of creation, was accomplished in six days. So here's the point. Where's there time for a gap? How could you squeeze a gap in there? Why would you even squeeze a gap in there? It's crazy. It makes no sense. It messes with the scripture and creates a bunch of problems. Let's look at the next problem. The gap theory puts death, disease, and suffering before the fall of man, which is contrary to the scripture. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, guess who? Adam. And death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men. Right? That's how it happened. Therefore, there, we understand that there could not have been human sin or death before Adam, and that's what the gap theory states. Because that's what you had going on in this supposed gap of millions and millions of years that you had death and this is. And they even say there's a whole race of... What? You get all that by squeezing that image? But again, once you tweak with God's word, it's, it's a whole unit. Leave it alone. But when man starts to tweak with God's word, it starts messing it up in other places. The problem is never with the word of God. It's man trying to tweak it. And this is what this theory does. Leave it alone, okay? The Bible also teaches clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Adam was what? The first man. So how can you have a whole race of people and all this other? No, I don't think so. And as a result of his rebellion, sin, death and corruption, disease, bloodshed, suffering entered the universe. Therefore, uh, before Adam sinned, there could not have been any animal or human death, Okay let alone a whole race of men before the, uh, Adam, as the gap theory would presuppose. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, another text, clearly tells us that Adam was the first man, okay? A couple more here. Thirdly, the gap theory contradicts what God said in Genesis 1, God saw that how much? All, so that encompasses all creation that he made, and it was not just good, it was what? Very good. Well, stop and think about this. How could a supposed gap involving supposedly disease, violence, death, and decay be described by God as very good, right? That makes God look uh, uh, contradictory. And fourth, the gap theory makes God look stupid and inept. Okay, this is actually a good point. What kind of God would he be if he needed millions and billions of years of death and suffering and trial and error and misfits and mutations before he ever got creation right, right? I like what one guy, he said, that he says, that God is mentally deficient. You need to get a God like mine who does it right the first time. And that's what the Bible teaches. He did do it right the first time because he's not mentally deficient, okay? He's all powerful, okay? But again, folks, uh, you can see the gap theory, it's not just ungodly. It not only calls God the Father a liar. Uh, it's not only unbiblical and it twists the scripture. But listen, it's unnecessary, you don't need to bow a knee before the live evolution, not even when it comes to their dating methods of millions and billions of years. The evidence, not just the biblical evidence, but as we've been seeing in our study, this scientific evidence points to, guess what? Yeah, the Bible's right. We have literally been here for only a few thousand years. Jesus is not a liar, and nor is God the Father a liar, okay? But you might be out there, and you might be thinking, and maybe this is, you know, if you can get to this point in the discussion with the non-Christian, they'll probably say something like this. Well, okay, so maybe uh, evolution, when you look at the premise of it, it calls Jesus and God a liar, okay, and uh, got some problems with that. But wait a second. What about that carbon dating stuff? You ever hear that? People bring that up? We know that we've been here. I don't care what you say. And yeah, maybe this disagrees with the Bible, but we know we've been here for millions and billions of years because of carbon dating. You ever hear that? Okay, you only hear that. That's all you hear 
uh, in the educational system and the media, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And uh, so that's what we're gonna do over the next two studies. We're gonna take a look at the supposed accuracy, wink, wink, as you're gonna see, of the evolutionary dating methods. And this is the ultimate dating game, because this is what it is. This is, this is so ridiculous when you look at it. It almost just, it, 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 uh, just incites you. It's just like, what? This is such a lie? Okay, but remember, as we saw the last two weeks, you have to have, if you're going to believe the cartoon of evolution, what do you have to have to make it work? The fairy tale. Long ago, far away. You have to have millions and millions of years. So these guys have come up with a bunch of baloney bunk science to supposedly scientifically prove that we really have been here for millions and millions of years, okay? And so that's what we're gonna look. And the first problem that I have with evolutionary dating methods is, listen, folks, they don't even function like they're supposed to, okay? They do not function the way they're supposed to. So to get the feel of uh, the study, of the evidence we're gonna take a look at tonight, go ahead and turn to somebody and say, hello, McFly. Okay, because we're gonna take a look at this evidence. It's like, you got to be kidding me. What a lie, okay? I'm telling you, it's one of the biggest con games of all time. And what we're going to see is these evolutionary dating methods. I don't care. Pick any one you want. They're not just not accurate, but they don't even function the way that they're supposed to be functioning. And tonight, uh, I only have time to get into the carbon dating one because there's other ones that we'll get to, Lord willing, next week. But we're going to take a look at carbon dating. But let's do our homework and let's understand the premise Okay, we're not going to be biased. Let's just deal with the facts. Let's first get acquainted with how carbon-14 dating is supposed to work. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Okay, carbon-14 or C-14 dating was considered to be a tremendous breakthrough in science when Willard Libby, uh, that's a picture of him on Time Magazine, devised it in 1946. Now, here's how it's supposed to work. Okay, carbon is a naturally abundant element found in the atmosphere. Uh, in the earth, in the oceans, in every living creature. Key point, we'll get to that later, okay? It's formed by the sun's radiation striking the earth's atmosphere where it then converts into nitro the nitrogen into carbon-14. Then carbon-14 combines with the oxygen to give carbon dioxide, and so it gets cycled through the cells of plants and then into animals as they eat the plants and then into you and I's people when we eat plants and animals, okay? So that's how we, as living entities, plants living, animals living, us living. How many guys are living tonight? Praise God, all three of you, the rest of you. At least it makes our attendance look great. But anyway, <laughs> mannequins, that's a new technique in church attendance. Get mannequins from Walmart. <laughs> Some people would probably do that, you know what I'm saying? Maybe whatever. Anyway, so we're living, right? So that's how we get it. Living things ingest carbon-14 in the atmosphere, okay? Now, here's the premise, though. But when a creature dies, it ceases to consume carbon-14. How many guys can verify that when a person dies, they don't breathe no more? So guess what? You're not sucking in carbon-14, okay? So it ceases to die, and it ceases to consume more carbon-14, all right? And the C-14 that's already in your body from all the years of sucking it in, it starts to decay and turn back into nitrogen, right? So that's the premise, right? So here's the idea with this dating method. If we find the remains of a dead creature, person, plant, animal, whatever, whose C14 ratio is half of what it's uh, supposed to be, we can assume that the creature has been dead, logically, for about 5,730 years uh, since the half of the C14 missing takes 5,730 years to decay back into nitrogen. Okay, that's the figure. Now, if the ratio of C14, you say, oh, that plant, it only has a quarter of what it's supposed to have a C14, uh, then we can assume you double it. The creature's been dead for 11,460 years or two half-lives. Okay, so that's how they're, they're supposed to work. So the amount of C14 in that once living thing decreases as time goes on, okay? And therefore, the premise is that based on this rate of decay, or what's called the half-lives, okay, that you have a clock that starts ticking the moment something dies, right? So living things, plants, animals, or people, that's the key word, living things, they ingest carbon-14. When a plant or an animal or a person dies, they cease to absorb it and the carbon-14 starts to decay. And it's that decay rate that they say gives us a clock to date. So you, you understand it? You will not get that on the back of a granola bar. So I'm telling you, it's a, it's a challenge to try to explain this uh, in simple terms. But anyway, so, so here's the point. Now on the surface, on the surface, if you look at this, it sounds like it's pretty logical, right? Seems, seems you know, kind of logical. It should function, it should be reliable. 
But the first problem that I have when it comes to carbon dating is again, what we just saw, is it only works on previously living things, okay? And I bring this up not so much for the scientists because they know better, but it's for the average Joe, okay? The process we just saw of carbon-14, carbon dating, is that it goes into plants, okay, as they ingest it, and then it goes into animals as they ingest the plants, and then it goes into people as we ingest the animals and the plants, okay? Now, here's the point. Notice it didn't say rocks, okay? And the reason why I say that is because how many guys realize that rocks are dead? Okay, in other words, they're inanimate, okay? You guys are three for three tonight. You're doing awesome, okay? Now, secondly, how many guys can verify that rocks do not eat animals or plants or people? Now, here's my theory, because uh, it gets hot out here in Vegas, you know, in the desert. If you do see a rock eating a plant or an animal or person, run, okay? Number one. Number two, get in the air conditioner, get the brain cooled down, because you're seeing things, okay? But anyway, uh, but anyway, okay, but here's my point in bringing that up. You might think, oh, okay, yeah, duh, okay? Rocks are dead. They're inanimate, okay? Uh, but since they're dead, i.e. they're inanimate, they don't ingest animals, they don't ingest plants, so that means they don't ingest carbon-14, so, and again, I say this not for the scientists, they know this, but the average Joe that comes back to you and I, oh, we know we've been here for millions and billions of years because of carbon dating. The rocks, earthy, cr carbon dating doesn't work on rocks, okay? You have to have organic material that contains carbon-14 in you, okay? So if anybody came up to you and said that we know the earth is millions and billions of years because of carbon dating, because of the rocks, they just told you they know nothing about carbon dating. Okay, and again, I belabor this point. The scientists know better. The average Joe, they think this is the, the sacred cow that we can prove that we've been here. It, it doesn't work that way, okay? It doesn't work that way, okay? But secondly, uh, the reason why carbon dating doesn't function and give you those millions and billions of years, not just it's got to be a previously living thing, is it only works for a few thousand years. Carbon dating, even at its best, only works for a few thousands of years. As we saw, the process is based on the rate of decay. When something dies, a plant or animal person, it starts to decay, okay? And that's what they measure it, okay? But what they don't tell you is after you just go back a few half-lives, the measurement becomes so minuscule and tiny, it can't even be measured. If anybody comes up to you and say, we know anything is millions and billions of years old, whether it's a rock or even a previously living thing, because of carbon dating, they just told you again they know nothing of carbon dating. Carbon dating is not a method that can give you those millions and billions of years. And they admit it. Most of them say that you can't even go past 30,000 years. I found a resource that says it doesn't even work beyond 16,000 years. You can't get millions and billions of years from carbon dating. Here's just one quote, and this is from Geology News. This is back in 2001. And here's what they said. Because the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is the basis of carbon dating, widespread variation in the atmospheric balance would confuse the system. In other words, it's the scientific way is, hey, it's not really reliable. But anyway, we'll get to that later. Carbon dating has long been known to be unreliable for objects over how old? This is from their own camp. So again, if somebody comes up to you, oh no, we know we've been here for millions of years because of carbon. Better tell the evolutionists, at least on this point, they agree. It doesn't work. It can't give you millions and billions of years. That's a lie. This discovery suggests that uh, some ancient items may be several thousand years out. In other words, uh, we might be wrong. <laughs> We're just getting started, man. This is the biggest con game of all time. It doesn't work for the big game. Now, here's the irony. Christians are caving on this issue. They're messing up the scripture, trying to squeeze in that lie called the gap theory. And even the evolutionary scientists admit it doesn't work for millions and billions of years. It's just, it's crazy because of the lack of education in the Christian community, we're caving in on something that's absolutely ridiculous. Okay, and that's what's sad about it. Okay, but that's not all. Not only are the evolutionists admitting that carbon dating doesn't work for the millions and billions of years, only a few thousand years, the actual inventor himself, Willard Libby, admitted that when you take a look at the evidence, the only reliable evidence shows, and this is the guy that invented it, um, it's only for a few thousand years. 
Let's take a look. This is a direct quote from him. After he came out with this uh, about a decade later, this was in 1956, and this was actually recorded in the American Scientist magazine back in January 1956. And he said this, the first shock Dr. Arnold and I had was that our advisors informed us that history extended back only what? 5,000 years, but they came up with carbon dating. They're going to prove them wrong. No. He says, you read the books and you find statements that such and such a society or archaeological site is said to be 20,000 years old. He says, we learned rather abruptly that these numbers, these ancient ages are what? Not known. Listen to this. In fact, it is about the time of the first dynasty in Egypt that the earliest historical date of what? Any real certainty has been established. So here's the inventor of carbon dating saying that the only date that we have that can be established with any real certainty is we've only been around for a few thousand years. That was an abrupt shock to us, but that's what the facts show. So I'm kind of thinking if the inventor of carbon dating admits that with any real certainty, it appears we've only been around for a few thousand years, We've probably only been around for a few thousand years. How about you? <laughs> That's what he said, okay? But there's still in it all, okay? The third reason why carbon dating doesn't function like people want to say it does, millions and billions of years, okay, because it only works at equilibrium. Now we're going to get into some evidence proving, and you can flip it around when you get into these discussions, carbon dating actually agrees with the biblical account. Carbon dating can actually be used to prove we've only been here for a few thousand years when you take a look at the evidence. And the first evidence is this equilibrium issue, okay? And uh, let's, let's take a look at what the, the premise of this equilibrium issue is, okay? When Willard Libby invented the carbon dating technique, he made a major assumption. Now, I'm telling you, get here, Lord willing, next week, because don't miss it. Because in all the other dating methods, the radiometric dating methods, they do the exact same fatal flaw. They make assumptions that everything today is the same as it's always been, and it's not, okay? And it messes all their dating methods up. But so he made an assumption and he assumed that the amount of C14 in the atmosphere today would be the same amount found in living plants or animals. And this is because he assumed that the rate in which C14 was being created in our atmosphere and the rate in which it was decaying was stable or in other words, equalized, okay? Uh, this is what they call the point of equilibrium. Let me give you a demonstration. If you were trying to fill a barrel uh, with water, but there were holes drilled up the side of the barrel. Anybody ever do that getting real? Your dad laid hands on you growing up after doing something dumb like that? Apparently just me and maybe Ron, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. Right, you thought it was funny. Anyway, but you got holes in there, all right? Now, as you filled the barrel with water or tried to, it'd start to fill up, okay? But guess what would happen? It'd start leaking out of the holes, right? We get a little visual here. At some point then, even though it would start to fill up, Okay, at some point it would equalize out, okay? It, it would, you'd be putting it in, it'd be leaking out the same rate, okay? You would not be able to fill the barrel past this point of equilibrium, you got it? So it's an easy, good visual. And this is what's going on with the carbon-14, okay? As it's coming in, as it's going out. It's like this barrel analogy. In the same way this water, in the, as the barrel's full of holes, C14 is being formed, put in, in the atmosphere, and it's decaying or being put out or leaking out simultaneously okay and so it was estimated according to evolution that a freshly created earth would require only about 30,000 years for c14 in the atmosphere to reach this point of equilibrium which should have long since passed because their date for the earth is about 4.45 billion years old so this should have happened long time ago right watch this this is wild Here's the problem. Tests indicate that the earth still has not reached equilibrium. Interesting. So according to the process of carbon dating, that's right, it not only upsets the whole C14 dating method, and it's not accurate because you're making a fatal assumption, but it proves even by its own premise that the earth, by nature of not being at equilibrium, has to be bare minimum at least less than 30,000. Carbon-14 actually proves that the earth is not and could not be millions, let alone billions of years old, if you understand the process, okay? Now, I call these moments, I don't know about you guys, I call these moments uh, God's way of saying nanny, nanny, boo-boo in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? That's what I call 
he always has the last word, okay? Uh, but but I, I want to close out on a couple more evidences, okay, that carbon dating actually proves that the earth has not been around for millions and billions of years. And usually at this point, somebody will bring up, oh yeah, well, we know we've been here for millions and billions of years because of uh, certain, certain rocks like coal or diamonds. Because we all know it takes millions and billions of years. Well, first of all, uh, coal is not a rock per se. Uh, coal is made up of organic material. Okay, plants and squish. And uh, diamonds are made up of carbon. Okay, so as we're going to see in a second. So that means because they have, they're made up of material that contains carbon, okay, then you could use carbon dating on them. So they're not like rocks like we were talking earlier per se, okay? But people will say that. They'll say, I mean, don't you know it takes hundreds of millions of years? How many guys have heard that? that how long does it take to form coal? Well, we've already seen that that's not even true with oil. We saw that people with the right conditions can create oil in 30 minutes okay with heat and pressure which is what you'd have at the flood okay but your typical textbook response is that uh it takes anywhere from i've seen hundreds of millions of years for coals to form okay i've even seen i just saw it again today that they say well we found coal in these seams that are supposed to be two billion years old okay so that's your typical textbook response but the problem is just like we saw before with oil uh, coal, if you have the right conditions, take plant material, piece of wood, whatever, you can create coal very rapidly. Let's take a look at some of that evidence. But if coal did not form slowly, is there any laboratory evidence showing that it can form rapidly? In this demonstration, Robert and David Gentry begin to answer this question. Earlier, we took a piece of wood like this inserted it in this steel pipe, added some water, and then sealed it up. The next step is to put it in the oven at about 160 degrees centigrade for two weeks. Now we're ready to examine the results of this experiment. see this wood is now darker in color. It's also softer. A chemical reaction between the steam and the wood under pressure has caused these changes to occur. But clearly the process of coalification has begun. That guy should have some more wrinkles because obviously that took 14 million years to form that piece of coal. I got to find out what sort of skin emollient he's using because uh, you know he obviously he found the fountain of youth. But what? I didn't take millions of years to form. Now, what did he say was the process that they can create coal very rapidly? They used water, which created hot steam, pressure, and heat, and you apply that to compressed plant material, and you can create coal like that. Hmm, I wonder what kind of a global event that contained water to the tops of the highest mountains that lasted for over a year that completely buried and compressed with high pressure heat, steam, and water all over the planet uh, could have created that. Hey, it rhymes with the flood for those of you wondering. Yeah. Excuse me? The flood explains why we have the coal. I wish I had more time to go into that because according to their own theory, uh, we shouldn't have these massive layers of coal that according to evolution, if it's a slow process, it should be intermingled with clay and all kinds of other stuff. It isn't. It's completely pure. It's like something took massive, massive chunks of foliage and plants and squished them and compressed them and made coal all in one shot. Only the flood uh, can split it. In fact, what's interesting, the Nature magazine, when it came out, uh, when they started to create coal in the laboratory, this is what they said. Listen to this. The material they produce, like what this experiment, the material they produce is indistinguishable from the real thing by all techniques so far applied to it. Um, it raises many interesting questions about coal chemistry. In other words, 
it messes up our theory that it's supposed to take millions of years to form. Right? That's exactly what it's saying. But that's just coal, okay? The other thing that people might say is like, oh, oh yeah, what about diamonds? We all know that it takes millions, not even millions. Here's the typical textbook response when it comes to diamonds. And again, just saw it again today. Here's their, here's their exact dating method. Anywhere from 1 billion to 3.3 billion, right? Now, if you guys were forced to uh, eat uh, in a cheeseburger contest, okay, you had your choice between 1 billion cheeseburgers versus 3.3 billion cheeseburger, uh, you would appreciate the lower variance, right? And you would hope they didn't make the mistake and say, oh, sorry, your plate was 3.3. Have fun, right? It, I, it just blows me away. They're supposed accurate dating methods. They have these huge variances, and you haven't seen anything until you come next week. Uh, Lord willing. But that's what they say. Typically, textbook, whatever, we all know that it takes billions, not millions, billions of years to create a diamond. You? Uh, thanks to uh, Christian scientists, uh, Christian scientists decided to put them to the test. Now, uh, they, uh, the scientific community says, well, this is a waste of money. This is a waste of time because we all know it takes billions of years uh, to form these diamonds. So, Obviously, evolution, uh, carbon dating, doesn't work for only a few thousand years. They'll say 16,000. So even according to evolution, you should find zero carbon in diamonds, right? It should have all long gone been uh, depleted. Well, Christians decide to go ahead and test diamonds. And guess what? There's still carbon in there. Watch this. This is wild. You've heard that diamonds are a girl's best friend, but diamonds also teach us an important lesson about the age of the Earth. Diamonds are made of carbon. One rare type of carbon, known as carbon-14, is radioactive, which means that it breaks down over time. By measuring the amount of decay, scientists estimate how old something is. Some people think that carbon-14 dating proves things happened millions of years ago, but that's wrong, because carbon-14 decays so fast that something a million years old could not contain any carbon-14. Geo physicist Dr. John Baumgardner recently investigated the level of carbon-14 in diamonds. Many would have considered such research pointless because the diamonds were supposedly over a billion years old, which meant all carbon-14 should have decayed. But the radiocarbon labs detected significant levels of carbon-14, which suggests the diamonds are much younger, only thousands of years. Hmm. All right, round two. I think this is another way that God does something like this. Nanny, nanny, boo-boo in Jesus' name, right? And ladies, I think you have a wonderful opportunity to, uh, uh, to witness to the people around you. You just hold up your wedding ring. Hopefully it's not a zirconium and I'm not starting to trouble. Uh, but <laughs> you hold up your wedding ring and you say, hey, look at my ring here. Isn't this awesome? Look at this. Did you know this ring proves two things? It proves that I'm married, hopefully. Okay. And secondly, it proves we've only been here for a few thousand years. Can I tell you about it? Isn't that wild? The actual scientific data. Isn't it funny how the actual technique that people will approach you and I as the Christian and say, oh, you guys are big dum-dums. We all know that the earth and life, we've been around here for millions and millions of years because of carbon dating. But when you take a look at the actual facts and even the process of carbon dating and the actual evidence, carbon dating actually agrees with the Bible. Nanny, nanny, boo-boo. In Jesus' name is the code word for that, okay? But again, you might be thinking, well, what about all those other dating methods they have out there? Because there, there is. There's other ones called radiometric dating methods, potassium argon, other things of that nature. Uh, don't those methods, evolu uh, carbon dating doesn't give you millions and millions of years, but don't they have other methods that give them the millions and millions of years? Uh-huh, they got a bunch of them. But as we're going to see, Lord willing, next week, they are the most unreliable, whacked out methods ever. And we're going to take, we're going to put them to the test and when we take a look at it, you tell me if anybody should bank any kind of uh, uh, truth on them. They are so unreliable, it's ridiculous, and they make all kinds of faulty assumptions. I'm telling you, it's the biggest con game, the biggest dating game of all. But Lord willing, we'll get to that next week. Let's go ahead and pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done 
have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy, okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. 
And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it. If he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that? right now well this has been pastor billy crone of sunrise baptist church and and get a life ministries and if there's anything that we can do for you uh please don't hesitate uh to contact us uh our number our information will uh come up here on the screen shortly and uh uh if there's anything we could do for you please don't hesitate to let us know uh thank you for uh joining us and uh remember i hope to see you in heaven god bless Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.